light to our feet, it's light to our minds, it's light to our spirits, it's purpose, it's destiny. You have taken your word because it's alive and transformed all kinds of situations. So we welcome uh, you, Jesus, the living word now to come through the word that's recorded for us by your spirit. So we'd see more of your kingdom, we'd experience more of your kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. So, yeah, I won't call this every Sunday. I haven't so far. But you can see this is why I mentioned it in passing. The New Jerusalem Bible has got the Apocrypha and everything in it. And endless notes. I don't know how many pages it is. It's lots of pages and it's heavy. And you can see, but I promise I didn't steal it. <laughs> 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 it was. You know, the public libraries are forever moving stuff out. We must have picked it up at one of their annual sales for a dollar or whatever or three dollars. Yeah, it's a discard. See, I'm legit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we believe it. <laughs> <laughs> we believe <laughs> it. <laughs> Go stealing Bibles. I'm <laughs> 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 I follow Jesus. I steal Bibles. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that right? I stole a Bible on the car that saved you. Wow. Good for them. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's fine. That's the truth. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read from this. It's the one that I have that I read each morning, or at least I have been since we've been working through Acts last fall. It's pretty interesting. I normally read the NIV, um, and I use the NIV typically when I actually come and read this. You may recall for this, but. I'm going to read it. It's Acts chapter 14, so it's going to be a little bit different than the NIV. For this, I need glasses. Chapter 14 of Acts. It happened that at Iconium, they went to the Jewish synagogue in the same way they've been doing previously in Antioch. And they spoke so effectively that a great many Jews and Greeks became believers. However, the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles against the brothers and set them in opposition. Accordingly, Paul and Barnabas stayed on for some time, preaching fearlessly in the Lord. And he attested all they said about his gift of grace, allowing signs and wonders to be performed by them. The people in the city were divided. Here we go. Some supported the Jews, others the apostles. But eventually, with the connivance of the authorities, a move was made by Gentiles as well as Jews to make attacks on them and to stone them. When they came to hear this, they went off for safety to Laconia, where in the towns of Lystra and Derbe and in the surrounding country, they preached the good news. There was a man sitting there who had never walked in his life because his feet were crippled from birth. He was listening to Paul preaching. And Paul looked at him intently and saw that he had faith to be cured. Paul said in a loud voice, get to your feet, stand up. And the cripple jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the language of Laconia, the gods have come down to us in human form. They addressed Barnabas as Zeus, and since Paul was the principal speaker, they called him Hermes. The priests of Zeus outside the gate, proposing that all the people should offer sacrifice with them, brought garland and oxen to the gates. When the apostles, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard what was happening, they tore their clothes, rushed into the crowd shouting, Friends, what do you think you are doing? We are only human beings, mortal like yourselves. We have come with good news to make you turn from these empty idols to the living God, who made sky and earth and the sea and all that these hold. In the past, he allowed all the nations to go their own way. But even then, he did not leave you without evidence of himself in the good things he does for you. He sends you rain from heaven and seasons of fruitfulness. He fills you with food and your hearts with merriment. With this speech, they just managed to prevent the crowd from offering them sacrifice. <laughs> then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium, the last two stops. And turned the people against them. 
They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the town, thinking he was dead. The disciples came crowding around him, but as they did so, he stood up and went back in, into the town. The next day, he and Barnabas left for dirt. Having preached the good news in that town, it made a considerable, considerable number of disciples. They went back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. They put fresh heart into the disciples, encouraging them to persevere in the faith, saying, we must all experience many hardships before we enter the kingdom of God. That before we enter is interesting if you compare to the NIV. It's, we're not going to go there today. but <clears throat> um, In each of these churches, they appointed elders. And with prayer and fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had come to believe. They passed through Pisidia and reached Pamphylia. Then after proclaiming the word at Perga, they went down to Atalia and from there sailed for Antioch. That is the Antioch uh, in Syria that they had come from in the first place. Where they had originally been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On their arrival, they assembled the church and gave an account of all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. They stayed there with the disciples for some time. Well, that's a whole chapter. It's a short chapter in Acts. There's a lot going on. Not just a day in the life. There's, who knows, months in the life compacted. So I'm going to start with a question for you, because it says early on in this, this is in verse, verses are in the margins, they're not very helpful, verse 3, I think, that Paul and Barnabas stayed on for some time in Iconium, preaching fearlessly. So what do you do fearlessly with other people? Not much. <laughs> with other people. I mean, we could look at different kinds of things, you know, like for myself, though I can't say I do it fearlessly, I'm out bike. <laughs> you know, you could take something like that, but I'm thinking now of people. An immediate something came to mind, some, but I'm curious before I offer this. What do you do fearlessly with other people? Bill? <laughs> when I'm in uh, the role of serving people at the market, I'm not afraid. Yeah. Can everyone hear that? Super. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? I think my ch my children are fearless with me. <coughs> are you fearless, fearless with, with them? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Awesome. You know what your role is too. Yeah. I'm my mom. <laughs> you are. Oh, others. Uh, let me take one that this is a standard, and, and I haven't seen these stats for a long, long time now, but it used to be said that in the top ten things that people are afraid of, it would be to come up and stand in front of people on the street. Uh, to be able to do that fearlessly, it's interesting. Both of what you said. I've spent my life doing it. You put your finger on something. You're fearless, and you know why you're there. There for others, not for yourself. I'm not saying that's exhaustive, but as a, a starting point, or sort of foundational, those are pretty big deals. Anyone else? What do you think fearlessly would be? Protecting people. Protecting people? There again, you're serving, you're stepping into a place where it's not about you. Very interesting thing to be in a role that is life to you, not about you. And I, if we could go down that road, but it's just that much because it's interesting to think about these apostles. Again, they're speaking fearlessly, though there's a there's clear opposition. Uh, one other example that comes to mind, though, um, that I wanted to say, in light of what you said, Ken, <clears throat> if you had to go and be with a group of kids, say between four and eight, a bunch of them, 
and you weren't used to doing it. A little bit of terrified. right? Be terrified. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas, and I was thinking of Debbie in this context, there'd be others, but Debbie obviously has already acknowledged that today. She's been doing this for years. For her, it's the same as you. This is why I exist. Doesn't mean there aren't challenges in it, or that she doesn't have to prepare, or anything like that. But it's, we're here for purpose. And I'm part of the purpose. And that's a gift. In fact, I would say in there somewhere is the whole meaning of life. Finding that place for each of us, where whatever it is, and it doesn't have to be all the time with other people. I spend a lot of time for what I do on my home as a researcher. But I also stand up with people. So that's the way of meditation about thinking of these apostles facing all kinds of opposition. I mean, kids can challenge us, right? Um, as they get older, sometimes it can be opposition. <laughs> right? They can push back against us pretty heavily. But in principle, they're not our enemies. Uh, Paul and Barnabas met enemies. Dedicated enemies. He followed them. Who followed them? Who followed that <laughs> plotted against them and then followed them. And <coughs> other people to become their enemies. Yet it's a very interesting set of circumstances here. Okay. So, very quickly, so Paul and Barnabas get thrown out of Antioch. It says they're expelled from the region. They get thrown out so they get down the road to Iconium. They start over again, same thing, they go to the synagogue. Again, divided reception. And it's interesting, of course, there's divided reception. I think I emphasized this in part last time because they're successful. If nobody or party anyway would pay attention to them, no one else would care. But it's the very success of the gospel that gets them in really deep. People are going with them. They're listening and believing. So with success, trouble. That's what it is here at least. Um, and in Iconium, the Jews who didn't believe worked on the Gentiles who didn't believe. And again, it, it's a pattern where the Gentiles have authority in the region. You can work the Gentiles up, then you can create trouble with these apostles. It must have been a super interesting situation because then it says they hung in there for quite some time, preaching fearlessly. So they live in a tug of war, presumably. And their followers, presumably, not as much as them. There must have been quite a bit of social tension in this town. And here we have, I mentioned last time, we didn't see much of this in their previous ministry, but now all of a sudden signs and wonders are recorded. It doesn't mean they weren't there at the previous stop, but now they're, they're moving. It says God attested to their word, signs and wonders. And their first, these are the first ones recorded since the striking blind of the sorcerer. So, signs and wonders. We'll come back to this at a later date. I would just comment right now. Signs and wonders are an amazing testimony. As, as this text says, they attest to the word. Signs and wonders don't convince people by themselves any more than anything else does. They can. They can assist. Of course, the proconsul in Cyprus, when he saw, he listened to the word, and then when he saw this sorcerer struck blind, and he accepts, he believes. But here, it can go either way. Signs and wonders don't necessarily turn the heart. In fact, the sense I have here is that signs and wonders would strengthen the convictions of believers not necessarily overturn the unbelief of others. So, Paul and Barnabas' opponent, opponents can't shut down the gospel, and so they plot. Uh, they plan what we would call direct action. <laughs> They're going to rough up Paul and Barnabas and stone It says mistreat them and stone them work these guys over. And then stoning is interesting. And I went looking, there's two different terms used. In 
didn't absolutely necessarily mean to kill someone. It could mean to rough them up pretty bad, help them, make a mess of them. It's a form of punishment. So they're going to stone them. And so here we have, they're preaching fearlessly. They've been there for some time. But when they hear of the plot, it says they fled for safety. It doesn't give us context beyond that. But it says they got out of town. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> But what's fascinating in the next town, they don't get out of town. And Paul gets stoned. <laughs> and run back. <laughs> and they go back. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say subtext here is they've had a concentrated time in this town. The gospel has been established. There have been signs and wonders that have helped anchor the believers. And people have been healed so on and I presume they're listening to the Holy Spirit it's like well, yeah, we can go now now's a good time pick your battles right <laughs> and this is one you don't you don't need to face we don't know this but the implication is because they've had time there um, and the Gentiles here that are, are so offended by them they're presumably Greeks, not Romans. Uh, I think, yeah, great question. Yes, I, I think there was also partially a Roman colony here. Um, but yes, otherwise, I presume too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is the offense because they rejected being sacrificed to? Or is no, it just we like haven't got there yet. That's, okay. that's, but that's a fascinating question. Because once we get to Lystra, then all of a sudden, on the one moment, they're heroes. They're gods, not just heroes. And the next moment, here come the rocks. <laughs> Life with Jesus. <laughs> what can I say? Or at least, life on mission with Jesus. Yeah, right. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the question, Pam. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. It's, uh, yeah, it's good now. Yeah. Yeah. So, they flee for safety. It appears as they left, Lystra was about 40k down the road. It appears as they traveled, again, as I said, they're not weekend warriors. It looks like from the text, it indicates that they're preaching along the way. They take advantage of whoever they run into uh, between Iconium and Lystra. And then they get to Lister, and it doesn't say anything until we have this healing right up front. And I think another time we'll come back to this healing, because there's things in here about signs and wonders that we want to explore. Just really quickly now. Um, it's a healing very much like the one recorded in Acts chapter 3 that you'll remember when Peter goes up to the temple, and the lame beggar is there. And he looks at the apostles thinking, ah, oh, I can get something from Peter, of course. He's like, oh, so cool. I got something for you. Get up and walk. Um, and, and there's some interesting parallels. There's key things, focused attention. It's here and back in Acts 3. Because Paul looks intently at him, sees he has faith. That's what we'll want to come back to later. There's a command. Boom. Do this. The healing happens and walking. And I love it. Peter told the lame beggar to walk. He walked up and jumped. <laughs> he stood up and started to jump, leaping going into the temple. Paul told the lame man to stand. He jumped up and walked. Now, I'm not saying Paul told him no walk. He just breathes. But this is fascinating. He stands. He starts to walk, of course. So we have to assume, I think, that these people in Lystra had not seen the signs and wonders that had been done in Iconium, 40 kilometers away. And it looks like this came very early in their ministry there. It's the first thing recorded, at least. Possibly it was in Paul's first message. It says he's speaking. And he saw this man had faith responded to it. So there wasn't, the way I read this, there wasn't a message established from the end in this one. So this miracle happens. And it's a profound miracle. This man never walked. Crippled birth. 
can't really argue with that, right? <laughs> oh yeah, he had an accident last year. He hasn't walked for a while, but you know he was due to get up. I don't like that. This is this is a story. So the people, the crowd, so this was done in front of a crowd as Paul was speaking. They understood it in the only way they knew. They apparently did not have a foundation to understand the God that Paul and Barnabas were preaching about as the author of this miracle. Instead, they assumed, oh, this is our gods, and they've come down in human form. And they start to shout, and they start to shout in their own language, a language that Paul and Barnabas would not have understood. <laughs> So you can picture the situation. This dramatic miracle happens. The man stands up, starts to walk. The people, in a positive sense, it sounds like they kind of flip out with excitement. They start shouting. The gods have come down to us in human form. They get all worked up. They feel an obligation to do something for these gods. Right? You, have to, you have to. You have to sacrifice to them. You have to honor them. And so... This is going on. Paul and Barnabas are, they don't know what's going on, except there's wildness around them. Um, and it must have taken a bit for them to realize what was about to happen. <laughs> Once they found out, their response is dramatic. They start to tear their clothes, which is a sign of distress and mourning for Jews and Gentiles at the time. We're familiar with it, of course. I asked myself in going through this text, would the non-Jews of this town have been familiar with it? But apparently Gentiles too used it the sign of mourning, associated, for instance, with someone's death. So here they show their distress graphically. And they need to get the people's attention. The people are all caught up in preparing the sacrifice. And then they start shouting in turn. How else do you get someone's attention in this group? They rush into the crowd. And they start this message. Now, it's the only message, if, if you know another one, please tell me. It's the only message I know in scripture that was shouted on the fly. Talk about improv. <laughs> The picture is of them running into this crowd, tearing their clothes to get attention, and then calling out to try to get a message through to these people who are about to sacrifice to them. The message is not your usual gospel sermon. I have to think that they hadn't learned how to deal with a situation like this at some point. <laughs> What do you preach when people want to sacrifice to you? Probably not on the seminary course list. If you're so successful that they want to sacrifice to you, which is how it looked, of course, like they've done something great themselves. They didn't, and the message is so interesting, they didn't have time to explain about Jesus. To whatever extent Paul had started to do that all They're in a mixed context. They can't assume knowledge of God that they have. These people have other gods, clearly, that they're about to sacrifice to. So they preach a kind of good news and a kind of repentance. But it's not the gospel of Jesus and repentance. It's who God is. You need to turn. So it's briefly like this. Turn from worthless things. And of course, the subtext here is you're just about to do something worthless. <laughs> Not a good idea. There's a bit of a hope there, I think. Um, turn to the living God, the God who is alive. He is the creator of everything. He's what we're not and what you're not. And your gods aren't either. They're not the And right now, God is intervening to show himself 
in a way that he didn't before. It's interesting, there's a kingdom message in there coming. The, the language here is, the nations in the past, God let go their way. Not anymore. He's got a message for it. In this situation, the evidence for God is not the message of the cross and salvation. They preach that, of course. But in this particular moment, there's not space to establish that. They're trying to get these people, they're trying to get their attention, trying to stop them short. And so, it's a message of God's creation and goodness. Rain from heaven, crops in season, plenty of food to fill your hearts with joy. And I don't know if anyone's got a Bible handy, but if you look at Psalm 104, we got a Bible there? Grab Psalm 104. I think it's verses 12 to 15. Maybe, Candace, if you have it there, you can read it for us. It would be very lovely. Because what they're doing is drawing on foundational Old Testament revelation about God and His goodness. So what verses again? I, I think it's, try from 12 to 15. Does that make any sense when you look at it? Uh, 104? Yeah, Psalm 104. Verse 12 starts with, The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied with the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle, and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. <coughs> One more. Wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. Yeah. <coughs> Wonderful. That is a picture of the goodness of God to all humanity, providing for them rain, crops, wine, bread. And here it's it's like a paraphrase that Paul and Barnabas are giving you. He gives you plenty of food to fill your hearts with joy. Picture of the goodness of God. So what they're doing is they're working to shift people's foundational thinking. If you want to use the metaphor, they're planting seeds. And it looks like they just, it says they narrowly managed to keep the people from sacrificing. Somehow between their distress, their torn clothes, and this message of the goodness of God, just squeak through. You know, I keep, sorry, yes. I, I was just thinking, um, if there, and I can see the distress, because I'd be equally distressed, but if we saw Herod, who took who took on God's glory and was filled with work, and if, and, Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the Holy Spirit, did not reveal the truth, they dropped dead. So here they're thinking, they no way are they going to share the glory of God at this point, and, you know, so I was, and I would be severely distressed thinking that somebody would put that on me. You yeah. Know, at this no. point. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. There's the fear of God at work here for them, too. And of course, a deep knowledge of God and. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap. I'm about halfway through, but that's okay. The main thing is you've got something to take away. I just have one thing to leave you with because of our time constraint today to do with him. Uh, we can assume after this incident they went back to preaching and teaching and got to speak about Jesus in more detail before their opponents came from Antioch and Iconium down the road. <coughs> we won't go there. But the one thing that I will leave you with is a question which is super interesting. So, in the previous town in Iconium, their preaching was attested by signs and wonders. Here it looks like, just like what happened with Peter and Cornelius, the sign and wonder went ahead of very much preaching. And it started early. So then they go back to preaching and teaching until their opponents show up. The question is, do you think there were more signs and wonders? <coughs> After the response of the crippled man, Yeah, it's, uh, I just leave it with you um, about how God works. 
because they had encountered this dramatic flashpoint. When there's a healing like this, people are going to read it the only way they know how, in terms of their own thoughts, until more is given to them. And so I'm just, it just makes me really curious. As they were preaching Jesus, then he did signs and wonders roll as they headed out.